I need you to help me solve a marital dispute between me and my husband, Guy. It's one of the greatest points of tension in our marriage. So now I need a church-wide vote. We actually took it to Instagram recently. Do you believe that tortillas belong in the fridge? Now cast your vote amongst yourselves if you're watching at home with your family or even if you're by yourself. Where do you put your tortillas when you come home with them? Think about it. We took it to Instagram. In fact, we never got more DMs or phone calls or text messages expressing people's very passionate stance on this. We started calling it Tortilla Gate. And here's what the votes say. Tell us Instagram. 53% said it's in the fridge. There you go. My husband is so mad about this. He is very passionate that tortillas do not belong in the fridge. It's a big point of tension. Maybe it caused some dispute amongst you if you're watching at home with your family or even if you're by yourself, maybe you're just torn apart inside at the notion that people would dare put tortillas in the fridge. My husband can relate to you. Certainly this year we have been torn apart amongst each other and inside of ourselves for things far greater than Tortilla Gate. In fact, what is your greatest point of stress right now? I want you to think on it. Do you know it? If you're with people, don't point to them. Don't look at them, just focus, look at me. Just think inside yourself. What is the greatest point of, of, of stress in your life? Is it a person? Is it an emotion? Is it a, a situation? What is the thing that's tearing you up inside of yourself the most right now? Let's talk about that thing. Right now, many of us feel torn apart because we're not sure of the future and we don't know how to plan ahead right now. Many of us feel exhausted because we're juggling all these various responsibilities at once. Many of us feel anxious because of pains in our world and, and pains right in our home with those that we love the most. We need some peace. I have really amazing news for all of us today. Peace is available. We're kicking off a brand new series called Before Christmas. There was this whole time, this whole world before Christmas ever happened, before Jesus ever came. Isn't that crazy? And we're going to Join today in the middle of a time of a lot of political and social unrest where kingdoms were conquering kingdoms, where people were divided about how they felt about kings, where God's people were broken and oppressed. We're gonna come into this moment right now. We're somewhere between 740 BC and 670 BC. And right here, we're going to meet a man named Micah. Now, Micah was a prophet. In fact, in this series, we're going to be learning from lots of prophets. And simply put, prophets were people who gave messages from God. Sometimes people believed them and sometimes people didn't. Like sometimes people listened to the prophets and sometimes people didn't listen to them at all. If you're a parent, you might relate. Or if you're a wife, you might relate. Or if you're a husband or a person, you might relate. Prophets, now prophets might sound fancy. Maybe some of them were, they're all very different, but I really like Micah. Micah was not fancy. Micah was not bougie. Micah was actually from a village in the outskirts. I really relate to Micah and his upbringing and his perspective on life. He kind of came from the middle of nowhere. He didn't come from a lot. In fact, when you read Micah and you hear his prophecy, you realize that he didn't have the same overall knowledge of the overall political life of Jerusalem that some of the other prophets did. Perhaps he didn't know it. He might not have gone to the best schools. He certainly didn't come from an area with the most opportunity opportunity or the most money. He lived outside of the center of power for his nation. But this gives Mike a very specific perspective, a really unique perspective. He has this very specific passion and care for the outcast, for the marginalized, for the least likely and the least advantaged. Micah was not as concerned about things out there, things outside of people's reach or hypothetical things that people could not access. No, Micah cared about real events that affected real everyday people right where they were. If you perhaps have ever felt like maybe I'm not the most book smart, 
but I'm more street smart, I'm more relationally smart, or if you've ever felt like, man, I may not know the ins and outs of every single theological or social or political issue ever. I may not be able to quote all 66 books of the Bible in order by heart, but I at least know we gotta love people and care for people and show God's love to people. I at least know that. You too will probably really like Micah. Micah shows a really specific concern for the social ills of his day. And so he speaks a lot of truth to power. In fact, a lot of his prophecy is him talking to Israel and its leaders saying that you are having injustice towards people. There's theft and robbery and there's unjust business dealings and there's mistreatment of women and and children. So rightfully so, Micah actually in his prophecy has some harsh truths to give to Israel's leaders to give to their systems, to give to their people. And I just, I wanna share all this to introduce you to who Micah is and what his perspective is. But I also want to explain that this world before Christmas, Micah's world and our world, we share in some similarities. And so here in the middle of a prophecy that Micah is giving, where he's giving Israel this prophecy of the highs and lows of all that's to come. He actually says in the middle something pretty, pretty really amazing. In the middle of this prophecy, he speaks on the promise of peace that is coming to everyday people right where they are. We're going to read in Micah 5, 1 through 5. Micah says this, mobilize, marshal your troops. The enemy is laying siege to Jerusalem. They will strike Israel's leader in the face with the rod. He's saying, we're in the middle of a war and we're gonna be for a little bit more. Verse two, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. He's saying, hope is coming from an underdog village. This would have meant a lot to Micah and a lot to the people he grew up with. I know it means a lot to a lot of us. Verse three, the people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then at last his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land. Until a woman in labor, sounds a lot like the Christmas story, right? Sounds like he's talking about Jesus. Spoiler, he is. Verse four, and he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength and the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed for he will be highly honored around the world and he will be the source of peace. Micah is saying, yes, there is brokenness right now. He's saying there is brokenness and some of it has been done to you and some of it has been your doing. And because of all of this, you're torn apart inside of you and torn apart from people around you and you're exhausted and you're anxious, but peace, it's coming. And peace, it's so much more than the absence of conflict or the absence of chaos. Many of us think, I just want some peace. We think we just want all these responsibilities to go away or all these stresses to go away. I just want a moment of quiet. I just want peace. I just want to sit here and watch Netflix for four hours by myself. And when that little notification comes on and says, you still there? Are you still watching? Yes, Netflix, I'm still watching. You don't know my life. One more episode. I just want some peace. Some of us think I just want some peace. I just want to sit alone in this corner by myself with the door closed with a candle. Just listen to Nora Jones for an hour. Mm, She just gets it. I just want some peace. I just want nothing left on this to-do list. I just want no more laundry, no more house repairs, and no more group text messages in the name of Jesus. I just want some peace. We want these moments with no chaos, but the peace that we're reading about, the peace the Bible talks about, the peace that Jesus is coming to provide to all of us, there's so much more depth to it than that. This kind of peace, real peace is so much more than the absence of something. It's the presence of something. It's the presence of wholeness. It's the presence of completeness. It's the presence of 
being able to be fully and joyfully yourself. It's about whatever's torn up inside of you, not being torn anymore. Micah is saying here, God is gonna send someone who's gonna make all things, not just without chaos, but with completion. And the solution to your brokenness is coming from an underdog village. And then he came. I wanna tell you four truths about peace today, four truths. One, it's here. It's here, peace is here. Yes, we live in a world very similar to Micah's in that there's brokenness and division and heartbreak, but we live in a world very different from Micah's in one major way. Micah was speaking in a time before Christmas saying that peace is coming, but we live in a time where peace has come. Jesus has come, Jesus is here. We know this story. We expect to hear about it at Christmas time. Jesus came in the form of a baby. There is angels and animals and wise men. Oh my, this is awesome. This changes everything. What I love so much about Micah's prophecy is that he wasn't just talking about an event that was going to happen. He was talking very specifically about the character of Jesus, how this person was going to change everything for everyday people, right? Remember Micah doesn't, didn't care as much about hypotheticals, things out of reach. He cared about how real events affected real everyday people. And he said, this real kind of peace is coming to where we really are. And then Jesus came. But when Jesus came, some people were still very disappointed. This was not the leader they were really hoping for. They weren't really sure if this was the savior that was prophesied about. They said that peace was coming. They weren't sure Jesus was it because there was still chaos in the world. There was still conflict in the world. There was still a broken government. There were still broken systems. People were still hurting. Was this really the savior? People were hoping for a political leader, someone who would mandate laws, throw over systems or change regulations, or who would lead armies and oppose physical forces. Then Jesus came and he didn't come to erase all of the external chaos. So people are wondering, is this really the savior? If he was really God, why wouldn't he overturn the government? Why wouldn't he end all the wars? Is this really God when life is still so unfair? Maybe you have felt that way this year. Maybe you've said this painful circumstance hasn't changed. So where is God? The situation in my job hasn't changed or this problem in my relationship hasn't changed. So where is God? This door hasn't opened for me yet. So where is God? We want someone to bring external peace to our outward circumstances. But Jesus came to give us an internal peace even when those external circumstances did not change even when there's a global pandemic, even when people say hurtful things about you, even when opportunities are taken from you, Jesus came to provide a way for there to still be wholeness inside of you, even when there was brokenness around you. Peace from Jesus is more than the absence of chaos. It's the presence of wholeness, even in the chaos. This kind of peace, real peace inside of us, it's here and it's available. This kind of peace is available, real completeness inside of ourselves. It's available to everyday people like me and you, but are we accessing it? The other day I was on this new thing um, called Zoom. Maybe you've heard of it. It's this thing that we all use um, only all the time for everything. So I was on a Zoom meeting in between two other Zoom meetings, as we all are. And in the middle of it, I realized my, my computer was dying. And so I knew what to do. I ran to grab a charger and plugged it in. And in the middle of this meeting, as I'm talking, my computer dies. Why did it die? One, because I'm very professional. And two, because even though I ran to plug it in, I forgot to double check to make sure the other side of the cord was plugged into the power source. I knew to plug in my computer, but I forgot to make sure it was attached to power. And a lot of us are living our lives this way. We're exhausted, we're depleted. We know we need to be energized. We know we need peace. We know we need to be plugged in, but are we plugging our lives in to the right things? 
Are we making sure that we're getting the right kind of power? I know that we care about filling ourselves up. I see us on Instagram, soul care, I need my soul care. But are we going to the places, to the place, to the person that actually cares for our souls, not just for this moment, but for a lifetime? We can't look for wholeness and try to get it from people. We can't look for completeness and and get it from circumstances, real peace that really completes our souls only comes from Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself says this in John 14, 27, Jesus says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Jesus never said, I'm gonna leave your circumstances with some peace. Jesus never said, I'm gonna leave your situation with some peace. He said, I'm leaving your mind and your heart with my peace. And this kind of peace that you really need is a peace that only I can give you. The peace that comes from Jesus is a peace the world cannot give and the world cannot take away. It doesn't come from people, so it can't be taken from people. It doesn't come from circumstances, so it can't be taken from circumstances. We can't keep going to people's opinions and expect to find in them the peace that only comes from Jesus. We can't keep going to our addictions, just one more hit from that drug or just one more shopping spree, one more moment to feel numb or one more item to feel enough and expect to find in these things the peace that only comes from Jesus. We can't go to our social media or Netflix or even our essential oils, Mm, even though that peppermint is good, that vanilla lavender is so good, even these good things. We can't go to any earthly things that do not last and expect to find in them the healing, lasting peace that our soul so desperately needs. That kind of peace only comes from Jesus. That kind of peace is here, it's available, and you can choose it. You can choose it. You can choose to attach your life to Jesus. You can choose to give your whole life to Jesus. And maybe you're watching today, you're joining us and you've never made that decision. Maybe you're not sure about this Jesus thing, but you know there's something inside of you that is torn. There's something inside of you that is not complete. And even though you've gone to relationships or you've gone to jobs or you've gone to titles, none of those things have been able to bring you the peace that you so desperately need. I want to invite you today to wholeness. I want to invite you to a person who can heal your heart and change your life. You can say today, Jesus, I choose you to be my number one, my savior. I'm going to attach my life to you. I give up the things that held me back. I give up the things that stood in the way of me and you. And now I want to attach my life to you and receive your power. And I want to receive your peace. And I'm ready to make that choice today. Maybe that's you today. Or maybe for you, You have chosen Jesus as your savior. You've chosen Jesus as your number one, but you are not attaching your life to him, plugging into him every single day. So you're exhausted and you're depleted and you feel like you're just living on autopilot. You're not being the best version of yourself. You know that, you know something's torn inside of you. I wanna invite you today to reattach your life to Jesus to make the commitment today, God, I want to be more intentional with my time with you. I wanna go out of my way and be more intentional with sitting in your presence and receiving your power in peace. I wanna be more intentional going out of my way to read your word more than I'm reading it. I wanna be reading it more every day to receive your power, receive your peace. That might take creating some new routines. That might take the intentionality of waking up 20 minutes earlier than you do. Before you open up your work emails, before you open up your social media, before you hear anyone else's voice, make your coffee, get that folders going and sit and 
read the Bible and talk to God and pray to him for 20 minutes, 20 extra minutes in your day. I don't know what it looks like for you, but maybe you need to make the choice to make an intentional commitment to reattach your life to Jesus. Real peace. It's here and it's available, but God will not force you to receive his peace. Many of us, we think, yeah, of course I want peace, but we just want it to happen to us as if external circumstances can just give it to us or as if somebody else can just make our life decisions for us, but no, instead peace, it's real and it's here and it's available if you choose it. Don't put off receiving peace. Give your life to Jesus today. Attach your life to Jesus today and receive his power and receive his peace. You are one choice away from an entirely new life. Real peace. It's here. It's available. You can choose it and you can give it. You can give it. You can make the choice to give peace right now. Last week, I was flying home into San Diego from a work trip, but the fog was so dense that the pilot could not see the runway. So audibly and reasonably, everyone in the plane was very concerned. And the pilot gets onto the speaker and says, the fog is too dense. I cannot see the runway. So I'm gonna have to take some time to think if I can maneuver and try to figure out a way to still somehow land here, or I'm gonna have to reroute us and drop you all off at LAX. So I'm sitting here thinking, do I want to gamble this? Do I hope that this pilot tries a dangerous maneuver with no visibility and tries to land this plane, endanger all of our lives, and risk it to try to guess where the runway is, or would I rather go to LAX? It was very close to a tie for me. Fortunately, the pilot is not a gambling man. He could not see the runway. He decided to reroute us and he dropped us all off at LAX. It's probably about midnight at this point. We found out that about six planes before us had been rerouted to LAX and about two planes after us that were supposed to go to San Diego are now in LAX. So now there's hundreds of us that are now in LAX and they're telling us there is no other flights going out this morning. There's no other way for you to get to San Diego at this point, but to get a rental car or an Uber and drive home. And we all looked at each other and said, we got this fam, everyone be calm. This is all gonna be okay. No, that's not what happened. Of course, that's not what happened. The opposite of that happened. People were so mad. People were climbing over each other. Like forget the fact that there was a pandemic that we're all in. People are pushing each other over. The baggage comes for all hundreds of us, all of our baggage come. The baggage claim is broken. Suitcases are piling over each other. People are falling over each other. People are yelling at the pilots. People are yelling at the people in the terminals. People are yelling at the airline attendants. Everyone's yelling at everybody, trying to get them to give us planes when there's, there's not planes available, trying to help fix the situation. No one can fix the situation. And you know what? There's a message in that for some of us. Like we can't keep going to people to make us happy and give us what our souls really need. We can't keep going to people that do not have the resources for what we really want. Because what, what we really all wanted was for the fog to be lifted, for us to be cozy in our beds. And these kind pilots did not have the ability to do that for us. They did not have more planes or the ability to change the weather. We cannot keep going to people that don't have the resources to give us what we really need. That's a word for some of us. But I also watched, now we're like at 1 a.m., 1.30 a.m. I also watched as many people, though they were not under the best circumstances themselves, though they were losing some resources themselves, though they realized they had to get a rental car and drive in the middle of the night themselves, I watched as people climbed up these piles, towers of suitcases and pull out suitcases for other people. I watched as families 
paid for the rental car for other families that couldn't afford it to drive back to San Diego. I watched as people gave people phone chargers who didn't have them with them. I watched as people pulled from whatever they had, though their circumstance was also terrible. I watched as they chose to create an environment of peace. They chose to give peace, though peace was not naturally happening around them. And I know today, many of us this year do not have an abundance of resources. A lot of us are hurting. So my question to all of us is what do we have? What do we have so we can actively give peace? Maybe for you, you have some extra time Maybe you have some extra time to join with your family and say, let's write out some encouraging texts, letters, emails, and send to people, ask them for a prayer request, and then come together with your kids and your family and all pray together, pray for people. Maybe that's something you can do with your time. Make it kind of like a family event for all of you. Or maybe you're here and you're thinking, you know what, I actually have some more resources. I actually have some more money that I can give. I can give above and beyond. Our church, we're a giving church. We love to give. We have so many ministries that we love to fund and resources that we like to, to give to help people that are hurting, to help people that are the least advantaged. And we're a giving church. That's why we care so much about our Christmas offering. It is an opportunity for us to give above and beyond, even though the outside circumstances are not ideal. We're thinking, what do we have? What can we do? How can we lead the way in giving peace? And if you you're here today and you're thinking, I do have some more resources. Maybe you too can join us in giving above and beyond so we can join together in being a part of giving peace. Or maybe you're like me and you've realized that a lot of your family may not have been online a ton before this year, but now they are. And you want to share peace. You want to give peace online. Man, the really easy way to do that is to share this message right now. It's really easy to share this message right now. If someone doesn't like it, they can scroll past. But what if they watch it and they're able to encounter peace today? I want all of us to be praying about who we can invite to watch Christmas services with us. I mean, every weekend for sure, because all month we're talking about Jesus. So share it every weekend. But specifically for Christmas services, are we praying about who can we share this with and say, hey, even across the country, will you watch this message with me? Church, we've gotta be intentional about giving peace. I know the fog is thick. Circumstances around us are not ideal, but if we wanna receive peace and if we wanna pass on peace, it is absolutely going to involve our participation. It's gonna require our involvement so we can be a part of receiving peace and giving it even when circumstances around us don't naturally have it. I wanna invite you today to pray one of these two prayers. I believe all of us are in one of these two seats. Maybe today you wanna to pray the prayer, Jesus, I'm attaching my life to you. I'm asking you to be my Lord and savior. I give my life to you today. I wanna to receive your power. I wanna receive your peace. I'm done being torn inside of myself. I want your peace. Maybe today after this message, you wanna pray that prayer and receive Jesus into your life. Receive real lasting peace. Or maybe today you're where I am. I've already chosen Jesus as my number one, my Lord and Savior in my life, but I wanna to choose today and I invite you to choose with me. I choose to commit to figuring out how to stretch myself to give more peace. Whether that's financially, how much more can I give? Whether that's with my time, who else can I encourage? Who, what other relationships do I need to invest in? Or whether that's getting creative with how I invite people online. I'm hoping that all of us are praying this prayer, all of us who have already chosen Jesus. Jesus, how can I stretch myself to give more peace in this season? I'm believing for, I'm believing for all of us this year to receive this peace, to receive this peace that the world cannot give and the world cannot take away. And for all of us to pass peace on, to give it to those who have never heard of Jesus or who need to reattach their lives to him today. Whatever choice you make today, I invite you to pray one of those prayers and let's be a part of a peace that changes everything.